Welcome to episode 19 of our Music History Podcast. Over the past few podcasts, we've been looking at early music. And more specifically, we've been looking at the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Now, the next time period that comes up for us is the Baroque period, which we'll start on very soon. But we're going to start by looking at the early Baroque period because there's so much overlap between that Renaissance period and that Baroque period as things start to change that the real changes don't happen until the full-fledged Baroque period starts. And the early Baroque is much more like these early music genres. So let's jump into thinking about the early Baroque period. At the end of the 16th century, music was undergoing rapid changes at the sophisticated courts and churches of northern Italy. Composers began to write motets, madrigals, and other pieces more directly for effect with a new simplicity in some respects, but also with the use of exciting new resources. A new style the style of the early Baroque period took hold rapidly all over Italy and in most of the rest of Europe as well. So let's start off talking about that transition from Renaissance to Baroque. As we've seen, the madrigal was the most advanced form in the late Renaissance music. Toward the end of the 16th century, the thirst for expression led madrigal composers to increasingly esoteric kinds of word painting. Extreme dissonances and rhythmic contrasts were explored in order to illustrate emotional texts in a more exaggerated fashion. At the same time, a reaction set in against the magical. In Florence, an influential group of intellectuals who called themselves the Camerata, meaning something like the Associates, mounted an attack on the Madrigalists' favorite technique, word painting. Word painting was artificial and childish, they said, and the many voices of a Madrigal ensemble could not focus feeling or express it strongly. Whatever the madrigalists thought, a choir singing counterpoint could only dilute song emotions, not concentrate them. True emotionality could be projected only by a single human agent, an individual, a singer who would learn from great actors and orators how to move an audience to laughter, anger, or tears. A new style of solo singing was developed recitative that was half music half recitation this led inevitably to the stage and as we shall see to opera invented in florence around 1600 opera became one of the greatest and most characteristic pro products of the baroque imagination so a little further away from Florence and Italy was Venice, and Venice had their own thing going on. So meanwhile, equally sensational developments were taking place in Venice, the city of canals. The Serene Republic, as Venice called itself, cultivated especially brilliant styles in all the arts, matched, it seems, to the city's dazzling physical appearance Wealthy and cosmopolitan, Venice produced architects whose flamboyant, varied buildings were built out of multicolored materials and painters, the Bellinis, Titian, Tintoretto, who specialized in warm, rich hues. Perhaps, then, it is more than a play on words to describe Venetian music as colorful. From the time of Palestrina's Pope Marcellus Mass, 16th century composers had often subdivided their choirs into low and high semi-choirs of three or four voiced parts each. 
the semi-choirs would alternate and answer or echo each other. Expanding this technique, Venetian composers would now alternate two, three, or more whole choirs. Homophony crowded out polyphony as full choirs answered one another stereophonically and seemed to compete throughout entire motets and masses, coming together for climactic sections of glorious massed sound. The resources of sonority were exploited even further when sometimes the choirs were designated for singers on some part and instruments on others. Or else whole choirs would be made up of instruments. As the son sonorous combinations of Venetian music grew more and more colorful, the stately decorum of the high Renaissance style was forgotten or left to musical conservatives. Magnificence and extravagance became the new ideals well suited to the pomp and ceremony for which Venice was famous. Whenever they looked, knowledgeable travelers to Italy around 1600 would have seen music bursting out of its traditional forms, styles, and genres. Freedom was the order of the day, but they might have been puzzled to notice an opposite tendency as well. Musical form was becoming more rigorously controlled and systematic. As composers sought to make music more untrammable in one respect, they found they had to organize it more strictly in another so that listeners would not lose track of what was happening. The control composers exercised over Baroque form, in other words, was an appropriate response to Baroque extravagance, exaggeration, and emotionality. We shall see rather similar forces and counterforces at other points in musical history later on. So, let's take a look at a motet by Giovanni Gabrielli called O Magnum Mysterium published in the year 1615. The most important composers in Venice were two Gabrielli's, Andrea and his nephew Giovanni. Andrea's dates are 1510 to 1586, and Giovanni lived from 1555 to 1612. As organists of St. Mark's Cathedral, both of them exploited the special acoustics of that extraordinary building, which still impress tourists today. By placing choirs of singers and instrumentalists in different choir lofts, they obtain brilliant echo effects that even modern audio equipment cannot duplicate. Giovanni's O Magnum Mysterium, the second part of a longer motet, was written for the Christmas season. The text marvels that lowly animals, the ox and the ass, were the first to see the newborn Jesus. And the music marvels along with the text. Quite in the manner of a madrigal, the exclamation, Oh! is repeated like a gasp of astonishment. Then lush chord progressions positively make the head spin as the words O Magnum Mysterium are repeated to the same music but pitched higher, that is to say, in sequence, as we saw earlier. A momentary change in the meter which slips from 2-2 two -two into 3-2 provides a new feeling of majesty as much as astonishment. Gabrielli uses two choirs, each with three voice parts and four instrumental parts, plus organ, though at first all we hear is a sumptuous blend of brass instruments and voices. Solo voices emerge at sacramentum. First solo tenors, 
Then boy sopranos echo one another during the line, Iacentem in prospeo, where a new rapid figure bounces back and forth from tenors to sopranos to trumpets. Gabrielli really unleashes his musical resources at the choral Alleluia section. The music moves in quick triple, triple meter, matching the jubilation of repeated alleluias, and the two choirs echo back and forth across the sound space. You can sort of see that um, illustrated here on the screen. See that the first choir says alleluia, alleluia, and as they're finished, it passes to choir two, then back to choir one, and then back to choir two. To make a grand conclusion, the choirs come together again. There is another wash of voice and brass sonority as the tempo changes to a slow duple meter for a climactic alleluia. For yet another alleluia, the music adds a solemn extra beat. The meter changes once again at this point. And for still more emphasis, Gabrielli repeats the entire Alleluia section, comprising the fast tri triple time alternations and the massive slow ending. Notice that there are certain parallels between the beginning and the end of O Magnum Mysterium. These include the tempo in meter, slow and changing, the texture, of massed choirs, and the musical technique used, which, like we said, was sequence. In other words, Gabrielli has imposed organization and control on the f flamboyant chords and solo rhapsodies. This is an example of the combination of extravagance and control in the early Baroque music that we have just discussed. So, Please sit back and follow along with Giovanni Gabrielli's O Magnum Mysterium and really think about those few things that we brought to your attention here just a few moments ago.
Wow. So that was the Sofia Vocal Ensemble from Stockholm, Sweden. That was recorded inside of a cathedral. And just imagine if you were there in person hearing that slow decay of sound and how powerful that might be. Well, let's talk about the styles and features of early Baroque music. Music from the period of approximately 1600 to 1750 is usually referred to as Baroque, a term that captures its excess and extravagance. It was originally a jeweler's term for large pearls of irregular shape. A number of broad stylistic features unify the music of this long period. The first feature is rhythm and meter. During the Baroque period, rhythms become more definite, regular, and insistent. A single rhythm or similar rhythms can be heard throughout a piece or a major segment of a piece. Compare the subtle floating rhythms of the Renaissance, changing section by section as the motives change. Renaissance dance is an exception, and in the area of dance music, there is a direct line from the Renaissance to the Baroque. Related to this new regularity of rhythm is a new acceptance of meter. One technical feature tells the story bar lines begin to be used for the first time in music history. This means that music's meter is systematically in evidence rather than being downplayed as it was in the Renaissance. The strong beats are emphasized by certain instruments playing in a clear, decisive way. All this is conspicuous enough in O Manum Mysterium that we just listened to. Another big thing that changed was texture. Some early Baroque music is homophonic and some is polyphonic, but other textures are enriched by a feature unique to the period called basso continuo. As in a Renaissance score, in a Baroque score, the bass line is performed by bass voices or low instruments such as cellos or bassoons. But the part in the Baroque music is also played by an organ, harpsichord, or other chord instruments. These instruments not only reinforce the bass line, it also adds chords continuously, hence the term continuo. The basso continuo, or just continuo, has the double effect of clarifying the harmony and of making the texture bind or gel. One can see how this device responds to the growing reliance of Baroque music on harmony, which was already clear in in that motet we listened to. In the early days, the continuo was simply the bass line of the polyphony reinforced by chords, but later, the continuo with its chords was mapped out first and the polyphony adjusted to it. Baroque polyphony, in other words, has systematic harmonic underpinnings. This fact is dramatized by a characteristic Baroque form, the ground bass. This is music constructed literally from the bottom up. In ground bass form, the bass instruments play a single short figure many times, generating the same set of repeated harmonics played by the continuo chord instruments. Above this ground bass, upper instruments or voices play or improvise different melodies or virtuoso passages, all adjusted to the harmonies determined by the bass. Baroque ground bass compositions that we will discuss are Dido's Lament from the opera Dido and Aeneas by Henry Purcell, and Vivaldi's Extravaganza Concerto in G, option 4, number 12. Another name for the ground bass comes from Baroque Italian musicians, 
basso ostinato, meaning persistent or obstinate bass. By extension, the term ostinato is also used to refer to any short musical gesture repeated over and over again in the bass or anywhere else, especially one used as a building block for a piece of music. Ostinatos and pieces built around them are found in most of the world's musical traditions, as we'll talk about soon. This is not surprising since the formal principle they embody is so very fundamental. Set up a repeating pattern, then pit contrasting musical elements against it. The final is functional harmony. In view of these new techniques, it's not surprising that the art of harmony evolved rapidly at this time. Whereas Renaissance music had still used the medieval modes, although with important modifications, Baroque musicians developed the modern major and minor system, which we previously discussed. Chords became standardized, and the sense of tonality, that's the feeling of centrality around a tonic or home pitch, it grew much stronger. Composers also developed a new way of handling the chords so that their interrelation was felt to be more logical, or at least more coherent. Each chord now assumed a special role or function in relation to the tonic chord or home pitch. Thus, when one chord follows another in Baroque music, it does so in a newly predictable and purposeful way. Functional harmony, in this sense, could also be used as a way of organizing large-scale pieces of music, as we shall see later. In a Baroque composition, as compared with one from the Renaissance, the chords seem to be going where we expect them to, and we feel they are determining the sense or the direction of the piece as a whole. Harmonies no longer seem to wander, detour, hesitate, or evaporate. With the introduction of the important resource of functional harmony, Baroque music brings us firmly to the familiar, to the threshold of modern music. And we'll leave that there for this podcast. We'll continue talking about the early Baroque period next time and dive into that world of opera that becomes so, so, so important in not just the musical world, but the artistic world of Western traditional music. So come on back next time when we start to look at the world of opera. Cheers.